the uh, session, which is a joint session between the National Heart Center and uh, King Faisal Cardiac Center at the National Guard in Jeddah. Uh, Dr. Jamil Rahimi, she's the chairman of the uh, King Faisal uh, Cardiac Center, and she will uh, inaugurate this session. Father Dr. Jamil. Thank you, Dr. Adil, and uh, I really would like to thank you for the success of this forum. Uh, it was really a great pleasure for King Faisal Cardiac Center to be uh, participating in this uh, very important event. Uh, I would like to ask the panelists uh, to join uh, the stage if they would like to. Uh, Dr. Atif Zahrani, Dr. Abdullah Saidi, and Dr. Wa'al Qashqari. Um, and with that, uh, we will start our first lecture where I will be the speaker, and then Dr. Atif uh, Zahrani will be continuing as a moderator. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's our pleasure to start our uh, uh, first session for this morning uh, with the first uh, talk, uh, Role of Echocardiography in Mitral Transcatheter Therapies uh, by Dr. Jamil Rahimi. Please, Dr. Jamil. Can I have the screen on the... Thank you. So, um, all right, so I will try to talk in 20 minutes about a very important topic, which is the role of echocardiography in mitral transcatheter therapies. Uh, so as we all know that mitral regurgitation is a highly prevalent disease. It was actually reported to be around 10% in individuals with heart failure who is at the age of 75 years or more. And it, with the consequences that led by mitral regurgitation, we end up by having patients with heart failure symptoms, reducing quality of life, and increasing mortality. So let's make it a really very important disease that has to be managed. Many patients with severe mitral regurgitation are either inoperable or they are at a very increased risk uh, uh, or a prohibited risk to go for uh, surgery or replacement. For that, the revolution came for the transcatheter devices, and um, as we can see through the years, there are were multiple generation of devices that has been released, starting from the edge-to-edge -edge repair, where we have the mitral clip system and the Pascal system, to the annuloplasty and the recent generation of having valve replacement with multiple uh, different devices of uh, mitral valve uh, procedures. So what was the supporting evidence for such uh, changes in the therapy of mitral regurgitation and mitral valve disease in general? So it started in 2011 when the Everest trial released its uh, outcome, having an improvement in the clinical outcome of patient who was treated with edge to edge to repair compared to patient who was having the conventional surgery, surgery for replacement. And they measured quality of life, the heart failure status, and the left ventricular function, which was all a positive finding in the edge to edge repair. And then we have the co-op trial, which was more structured for heart failure patient with moderate or uh, to severe or severe mitral regurgitation. And this trial was uh, really showing a significant improvement in, uh, and lower of all cause mortality within the 24 months of follow-up and uh, in, in comparison to the medical therapy alone. And I think we just heard that last week they released their five-year outcome again, which was uh, showing a significant improvement. So with this evidence, we were uh, sus suspecting to have a change in the guidelines. However, in 2014, when the uh, guidelines was released, we did not see the edge-to-edge -edge repair. This is came up again when the guidelines was updated, and it was clearly stated for both primary mitral regurgitation and secondary mitral regurgitation, and the latest version of the up uh, updated guidelines in 2020 uh, really stated the transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair as a 2A class to treat patients with severe mitral regurgitation who are either high or prohibitive surgical risk or who have the favorable anatomy uh, to have this procedure. And then I find this very interesting focus update of the ACC uh, expert who take a very uh, interesting decision pathway in the management of mitral regurgitation. They did add the exercise echo as a, a testing module that can establish the severity of mitral regurg, and they did recommend the transcatheter treatment uh, for secondary mitral regurgitation after optimum guideline med medical therapy for heart failure patient uh, and uh, those with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, what we really also found in 
these guidelines, interesting the role of the multidisciplinary team approach in addressing these cases and having a heart failure experts, interventionist, imaging experts, uh, mitral valve surgeon, cardiac anesthesia, and the rest of the team. Now, if you focus at the imaging experts or the echocardiographer who is expert in mitral valve procedure, you will find that he has or she has a crucial role in defining the etiology of the disease as well as assessing the severity. So let's start planning the procedure for truss catheter edge to edge repair, and then I will later touch on the valve replacement. So in edge to edge repair, usually the first question come to the mind through the MDT discussion is, what is the mechanism of the MR? Second question, what is the severity of the MR? And then we look at what are the consequences of this MR on the left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, and the pulmonary pressure. So do we have an answer for the severity of the MR? Yes, we do have the grading severity, which was uh, clearly stated in the guidelines in 2019 by Zogbi et al. and his group. And if you look at it, they really use a multi-parameter to assess the severity of mitral regurgitation. They consider structural changes um, a part of the assessment, qualitative Doppler, and quantitative assessments as well. Now, we as an echocardiographer, we tried usually to spend time on the quality Doppler assessment and trying to get the most precise uh, estimation and assessment for the effective regurgitant orifice area, the regurgitant volume, and the regurgitant fraction. Why? It really makes a huge difference in classifying the risk of the severity of these patients. Now, having said that, it sounds very easy to mention rather than to practice. So there are always the cases in the gray zone. When you find the ERO and the regurgitant um, volume and the regurgitant fraction doesn't really fit in the parameter for a certain severity or criteria. I find very interestingly that uh, a group in um, Austria, they released a unified concept, which I find it very uh, easy to use. And they here focus on the regurgitant fraction, which is basically how much the left ventricle can generate a stroke volume to have the calculation of the regurgitant fraction maintained above uh, uh, um, uh, or below the 50%. And they really uh, classify patient with regurgitant fraction less than um, uh, 50% as uh, a low risk or intermediate to low risk, while those of more than 50% will join the severe high risk group uh, if they were in the gray zone. Now, there are many pitfalls in echo assessment of the severity of mitral regurg, and I'm sure everyone understands that, including the interventionist. So in, when you look at the calculation of the ERO based on the PISA method, the PISA itself can give you two different estimation of severity by two different operators. So it's really very important how precise we are calculating the ERO based on the radius of the PISA that we use. This is a similar patient. Two different operators give you two different numbers of two different severity. The things also we found that we uh, uh, very well understand that the vena contracta or the origin of the jet is not as we uh, uh, think circular. In most of the cases, and particularly in secondary matter regurgitation, the hemi-elliptical or the non-circular orifice of this jet will make the estimation of the vena contracta and the radius of the PISA over or underestimated. 3D can be a modality to overcome these pitfalls. However, uh, it really needs the experience and the challenge in order to precise the management. Now, putting things together, when we put the parameter together, we have to understand some of the parameter does not fit. Then we have to go back again and look at our uh, uh, parameter that we use in estimating severity. For example, if I have a pulmonary vein Doppler with a systolic dominant, this is, cannot be a severe MR. If I have a mitral inflow with an A dominant, not E, a dominant, so we have a reverse of the EA ratio. Again, this is not compatible with severe MR. But if I'm looking at the hemodynamic and I see an E velocity above 120, which is an E dominant, and systolic reverse in the pulmonary vein, I would understand that this matter uh, regurgitation has to be a significant and more in the severe form. Now, that's in terms of severity. The second question is the mechanism. So we understand from the Carpentier classification that mitral valve can be subdivided into type depend on the definition of the pathology. So either the pathology is in the leaflet motion or the pathology is in the annulus, uh, in the leaflet structure itself. So it's either leaflet function or leaflet structure. So when we look at the leaflet structure, which we call it the primary mitral regurgitation, which is the degenerative mitral regurgitation, 
regurgitation or the organic mitral regurgitation. In the carpet TA, it's type 2, and it's, uh, described as an excessive motion of the margin of the leaflet, in other term where we call it mitral valve prolapse. And this disease, as we know, the primary mitral regurgitation can start from a simple focal uh, prolapse to a very severe form, which we uh, uh, label it as the Parlos low, uh, Parlos uh, disease. And uh, the, 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 the subtle shape of the annulus in the mild form can still preserve. However, we really uh, see an annular flattening at the severity of this disease. So here we are talking about a primary mitral pathology where we have really to act on the valve in order to correct this disease. Now. Now, looking at the other type of the Car carpentier, where here the leaflet itself is normal in structure. So we don't have an abnormality in structure, rather we have an abnormality in the function. And either type 1, which is a normal leaflet motion, but there are annular dilatation, or we see a restriction of the motion, and particularly in systole, and that's type 3B carpentier. Now, for type 1, the normal leaflet motion, I think in the past we were confused on understanding the mechanism, how a normal leaflet motion is causing a severe MR. But now, having studied more scientific evidence of this changes, we appreciate that the atrial annulus, when it dilates, it can cause a malcoaptation, and the leaflet will have a gap or a defect in the coaptation and causing a severe uh, functional mitral regurgitation. So the atrial functional MR, which is a new uh, nomenclature for type 1 Carpentier Edward, uh, if, you, if, you, if, uh, if you look at it, you will find it more commonly in patients with atrial fibrillation, patient with heart failure preserved ejection fraction, where the atrium tend to dilate. And there are subtypes of this um, uh, uh, mitral regurgitation. Either we'll see a central jet, so we understand that it is really an annular dilatation and malcoaptation, or there are a posterior directing jet. And in these cases, we understand that there are uh, hamstring or herniation of the posterior leaflet in the left ventricle development, and both of them uh, will have a normal structural leaflet. However, the function is affected. Of course, the restricted type, which we most commonly seen in the cardiomyopathy, either ischemic or non-ischemic, and it's either due to geometrical dilatation of the left ventricle. So we see the non-ischemic cardiomyopathy having a symmetrical annular dilatation, while in cases of ischemic cardiomyopathy, where you can appreciate a uh, wall motion abnormality affecting or tethering uh, the papillary muscles and the leaflets and causing an asymmetrical mitral regurgitation as part of the ischemic cardiomyopathy changes. So we understand the level of recommendation in the guidelines of 2A for both primary and secondary mitral regurgitation, but there are very important statements in the guidelines focused on the favorable anatomy. So what is the favorable anatomy? So we know there are a criteria for the favorable feature and the less favorable feature, and based on these criteria, we tend to select our patient for edge-to-edge -edge repair. So either we are focusing on leaflet pathology, the calcification in the leaflet, the gradient across the valve, the valve area, and then a, a very important uh, uh, information we have uh, to calculate related to the primary and the secondary mitral regurgitation, which is related to the either the flail width and gap or the co-optation depth, which I will demonstrate uh, in, 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 the, in these views. So in primary, we tend always to measure the flail gap, which is the perpendicular to the plan of the annulus, and it has to be less than 10 millimeter to be feasible for edge-to-edge -edge repair. And using the transgastric view or the short axis mitral valve view, we can um, estimate the flail width, and again, it has to be during systole, less than 15 millimeter to be feasible for edge-to-edge -edge repair. In secondary mitral regurgitation, we uh, have to estimate the co-optation depth and the co-optation depth, and based on these uh, set uh, criteria, the feasibility of edge-to-edge -edge repair can be uh, established. I find this very interesting. This just recently released, the Euro Intervention Group, actually, they did collect together their experience with the valve morphology, and they put the criteria together in terms from green to red. So green, where the anatomy is suitable and the experience of that center is maintained, and these are the <clears throat> features that they are looking for. However, when really these criteria become more in the non-favorable, in the non-favorable uh, uh, phase, and the experience of that center is challenging, here where we can see the uh, yellow to red zone. And again, we are looking on the same parameter of gradient valve area and uh, measuring the co-optation length and depth and the flail width and gap.
So what are the red zones that is really unsuitable for the tear? We look at anatomic, uh, anatomical associated with stenosis. So the calcification in the leaflet tend to be one of the prohibited features. Small valve orifice, less than 3.5, if we are talking about a presence of a cleft or a very short posterior leaflet. And here the measurement has really to be very precise. And sometimes we have a limitation in, with the patient themselves. Either they are unable uh, to uh, have a very very uh, good views to uh, obtain the procedure. Patients have another anatomical pathology like uh, cable interruption or ASDs and uh, uh, other clinical features. Uh, for example, the patient severity of MR causing severe hemodynamic compromise and patient could uh, have other causes of um, uh, circulatory uh, uh, compromise and requiring anotropic support. So these are examples, as you can see, uh, collected from the cases we are uh, trying to select for the tier uh, uh, approach. So as I said, annular calcification, perforation, which is very clearly seen here in the 3D view, large flail width and gap, as in this patient who is uh, close to the parlous stage and multi-segment pathology uh, tend to have a very adverse outcome. Uh, this is very interesting when I see that there are a group in <clears throat> Jack published the predictor of adverse outcome following the tear. And you can see the baseline echocardiography parameter play a major role in estimating these uh, 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 predictors for adverse outcomes. Looking very carefully on them, the mitral apparatus related echo feature really focus on the, uh, 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 the flail uh, uh, gap and the flail width, the annular diameter, the annular area, and the gradient across the valve. When we look at the non mitral apparatus echo parameters here where we focus on the left ventricle dimension, the left ventricle function, right ventricle function, uh, estimating the PA pressure and the tricuspid regurgitation. And when we have a severe tricuspid regurgitation with pulmonary hypertension, we know that this patient tend to do worse compared to the other. So what did the trial showed up? We do have the co-opt, which was done in patients who are on a maximum guidelines medical therapy, and then followed by the Mitra France trial, which was done in patients who have a more dilated morphological left ventricle, more uh, severely dysfunctional left ventricle. And these two uh, trials really gave us a framework which concealed the result of uh, trying to differentiate the mitral regurgitation patient between proportionate and disproportionate functional MR. So what does meant with that. Proportionate, that means the severity of the LV disease is the drive factor for the clinical course. And to estimate the proportionate mitral regurgitation, in a very nice review, they came up with a ratio of the ERO over left ventricle in diastolic volume and a, and a target of 1.4. So less than that, you know that the LV here is the, the key player or the main role of this clinical outcome. While if the MR or the severity of the mitral regurg is the drives of the clinical outcome, where we call it disproportionate, the ratio has to be higher. The ventricle will be less in terms of dimension and systolic severity. And these patients, the disproportionate matter regurgitation, when we're really uh, approached by the trans uh, catheter uh, valve repair, either edge to edge repair or replacement, they tend to do uh, better in terms of survivor and outcome. So it's very important to add to our criteria uh, classifying these patients based on these parameters. Now, what are the available device, and is the selection of the device important? Of course, yes, and the interventionists will know that. The mitral clip system went over four generations of devices. I think the majority uh, uh, of the team here is aware about it, and we know the Pascal. Each device had its own feature, advantages, and limitation, and you can see, looking in details on this feature, that the selection of patient can be made based on the anatomical and the pathological feature that has been collected by echocardiography. So, for example, the Pascal can be used if the length of the mobile leaflet in the grasping zone is short. It can be used when we have a small valve area or if there is a really wide gap. And the opposite can be seen in the mitra clip system. So how the echo play a very important role in the selection of a patient, it is still a pay, uh, play a um, very important role as well in guiding the procedure. And I can tell you that the interventionist will not be able to drive without the echo imagers in the room with them in the cath lab. 
So the recommended images for driving these procedures, and as an echocardiographer, we tend always to start the procedure by obtaining them. I can summarize them in these uh, six uh, planes, which is very important to remember and to be established in your protocol if you are uh, establishing a protocol for mitral edge to edge repair. Starting for apical four chamber view, to scan the mitral annulus and leaflet by commissural view, then the LVOT view, which is the long axis or apical long axis view. And that's basically to scan and screen the mitral annulus scallops from all different angle, medial to lateral, anterior to posterior. And then looking at the septum as the main entrance to the cavity, uh, we focus on the bicaval view, the short axis view, and then we have to estimate the hemodynamics with the left atrial uh, uh, pulmonary veins and, uh, of course, assessing the left atrial appendage and the transgastric view. Uh, I know my time is coming to close, but I hope to continue. So one of the most important view that we find it as an echocardiographer solidate our finding from scanning the scallops is the NFAST 3D view, which is really uh, mimicking the surgical view that the surgeon usually try to uh, tend to assess when they are looking at the mitral valve, having the aorta anteriorly on the top, we can really uh, uh, understand the anatomical distribution of the leaflet, the anterior on the top, posterior in the, in the bottom, and starting from uh, A1 and P1 uh, uh, at the side of the appendage, which is the lateral side, going to uh, the central and the medial side of the valve. Don't forget that this is very important, and looking at the commissure can sometimes exclude a pathology that is not suitable for this procedure. Like, for example, in this case where we have really to go off axis from the image plane in order to demonstrate a flail in the uh, far commissure, which is a very difficult uh, location to be grasped uh, during the procedure and make this a uh, very challenging procedure. The orientation of the regurgitant orifice and the origin of the jet is always a question from the interventions to the echocardiographer, and they really need that to guide their, uh, uh, to plan their implantation and to guide their catheters. So here two examples, uh, primary with P2 prolapse and secondary MR with tethering, and you can see a totally, do totally two different origin of jets, and that will really uh, 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 take the direction of steering the guide and trying to uh, grow uh, the, the origin of the jet or the location of this regurgitant orifice uh, uh, very importantly to be oriented for. Now how the procedure will start? We usually start with the transeptal puncture. One slide back. Okay, we usually start with the transeptal puncture. The interventions will ask for the bicaval view. We tend usually now uh, to have the explain uh, tool helping us throughout the procedure. So we differentiate the bicaval view uh, and uh, the short axis view on the same uh, screens. And they are looking to obtain this puncture at a, a very important uh, parameter, which is the height. So you really want the height of the puncture from the mitral annulus plane to be above 3.54 centimeter and more. And do during the procedure, when we really try to um, uh, uh, focus on uh, their uh, uh, steps uh, approaching the transeptal puncture, we tend to focus very well on the tenting, and this should be all uh, working clips. So we tend to focus very well on the tenting, and this is the landmark that will allow us to uh, measure the heights. And then uh, um, once we are really in a very sweet spot, we encourage the interventionists to go ahead and here where we can see the puncture and the release of that tenting. The next step will definitely be steering the guide through that, and it's very important for the echocardiographer to keep monitoring these uh, stages throughout the procedures, looking for the surrounding structure, monitoring the hemodynamics, and looking for any um, uh, um, uh, uh, unfavorable uh, position of the steering guides, for example, closing to the left atrial appendage or the pulmonary vein, or even the roof of the left atrium. Once the interventionists guide their uh, steering catheter, they will start now to steer toward the valve. So it's very important here to understand where is the origin of the jet. So steering the valve before advancing the clip, and, and there are very uh, uh, a few tips that they can use depend on which system they are uh, really implementing, and uh, either we are focusing on the medial lateral approach so they can pull in or push forward, or uh, the clockwise, anti-clockwise when we talk about uh, anterior-posterior movement. Advancing the clip is another important step, and the echocardiographer has to be really the first observer for this uh, uh, steps and how uh, really the relation of that uh, guide uh, to the surrounding structure. 
And then the question usually comes from the interventionist, what is uh, the best alignment of my clip to this uh, mitral regurgitation? And here where I can see the color Doppler will be the guide to exactly guide the alignment of the clip and advancing that clip according to the origin of the jet. Uh, I find the language between the echocardiographer and the interventions is very important in these steps. They have to understand exactly what they are uh, talking about anatomically as well as technically uh, with their floor steps. As you can see, uh, we, we reach a stage of grasping, and the grasping is one of the crucial uh, steps for the echocardiographer to ensure that the assessment of the leaflet insertion is done fully and the clip is fully attached to the anterior and the posterior leaflet, and the association of the motion and um, uh, diminishing of the mitral regurgitation to uh, uh, indicate the success of this uh, grasping. Now, uh, before they release, we tend always to go back and assess again uh, while the mitral clip is in place. Uh, the stability of the clip, looking at what residual uh, mitral regurgitation we have, we use the 3D and 3D color to assess that, and we can use the hemodynamic parameters and monitor the change from the baseline to the uh, pre-release stage and uh, comment on the severity of the residual mitral regurgitation. Now, if the procedure is a success, and really we give the green go for the interventionist here where we can reach the release stage of the clip. And as you can see, it's all echo-guided. So the echocardiographer is really the main driver of this procedure with the interventionist in order to really have the successful uh, implementation of the edge-to-edge -edge repair and to eliminate um, uh, the uh, mitral regurgitation uh, severity. Uh, some cases tend to have uh, the need of inserting more clips, and again, the same steps will be repeated. So once we reach that stage and the clip is in place and we are happy about this result, um, so the job is not yet uh, completed, we have really to understand that the evaluation of post-procedure is as important and as, cru as cru crucial to the intra-procedural result. And again, the guidelines help in uh, establishing some of the criteria and the parameter uh, to evaluate valve regurgitation after percutaneous valve repair and replacement. And if you look at this finding, really mimic the native valve regurg assessment. And we are really tending to depend on color Doppler, some uh, vena contract assessment by the 3D, and the hemodynamic with the mitral inflow and the pulmonary veins. What I really don't want to see, and it will really be uh, a, a very unfortunate finding, if post-procedure we uh, uh, end up by a very small valve orifice area, and this is one of the parameters for adverse outcome, uh, or a, a mean gradient that exceeds 4.4 in primary mitral regurgitation, or a mitral regurgitation that did not come less than 2+. plus. There are many predictors that can help in estimating uh, the uh, uh, residual regurgitation in secondary MR. One of them is the leaflet co-optation index, which I will not go in details, but I find these are all parameters that can really be added on. Post-deployment assessment and looking for the complication is the final important step in the echocardiographer role for the tier procedures. And here we had to monitor the transeptal puncture site and looking for that iatrogenic ASD, looking for the stability of the clip. You really don't want to end up by the attachment of the clip or a significant severe mitral regurgitation after deployment. We just had a live transmission case of a patient who had uh, an iatrogenic ASD post mitral valve uh, procedure for a valvoplasty patient who developed pulmonary hypertension, RV enlargement, and that was an indication to close the ASD. In this scenario, we can see bidirectional shunt patient was hypoxic, and we end up by closing that ASD. So this is really very important to be monitored by transesophageal echo and uh, uh, have the proper decision afterward. I know my time is over, so one comment on transcatheter valve replacement. We know this is, uh, again, a very uh, new revolution in the therapy of mitral uh, valve disease, and there are many available devices and more coming uh, as we know. It's very important to understand that the selection of these patients really focus in a very severe, frial, sick patient who is really unorbable and is not even suitable for edge-to-edge -edge repair. So are you talking about severe MR not suitable for the clip? or 
and degenerative bioprosthetic valve or severe MAC causing stenosis or an aneuplasty ring that become dysfunctional. And again, you can find that uh, selecting these patients based on uh, uh, their disease severity, uh, their uh, uh, surgical risk, and the uh, um, uh, feasibility of having edge-to-edge -edge repair will push for the mitral valve replacement, appropriate sizing, looking for the access choices, the role of CT in estimating the LVOT obstruction and the new LVOT OT for valve replacement is all very important uh, steps, and I think yesterday Dr. Sundus uh, touched base on these steps, so, and, it, and it showed a very nice overview how this is very important between the imager, either echocardiographer, the CT, and the interventionist. TEE will guide the procedure if it is a transfemoral or even a transepical uh, approach, and looking for the success of the valve, there were very ch uh, challenging factors, however, the outcome is very promising, so we are looking at a success rate of 90 94 to 97 percent, and uh, a, a very lowering percentage of an LVOT obstruction. Of course, valve in valve is more successful compared to valve in MAC or valve in a ring. With that, I would like to conclude that mitral edge uh, repair has been an invaluable addition to the therapy of mitral regurgitation. It is safe, it is powerful, and it has an impact on the survivor and the reduction of heart failure, hospitalization, and symptom improvement. ECHO, as you can see, play a major role in the assessment, procedure planning, procedure guiding, and post-procedure follow-up, and patient selection is the most important key factor for the success of this procedure and mitigate the complication. Careful planning is important in the MD team, knowing all the feasibility feature and looking at the uh, other approach of the transcatheter therapy, which is mitral valve replacement. It's a very promising device. However, it's used in a very sick patient, so uh, the outcome is still a questionable in certain cases. Uh, uh, what we really noticed that the experience is growing, and we're going to see uh, hopefully a future uh, best practice pattern uh, with uh, using these devices as emerge uh, in the uh, coming decades. Uh, thank you so much, and I really thanks for your attention, and we'll keep the question at the end. Thank you.